Hello, everyone, and welcome to A Propensity to Talk Density, a podcast from the experts at Bell Geospace. I'm your host, Tyler Kern. Thank you so much for joining me here for this episode of the show. Today, we're talking carbonates with three subject matter experts. First, we have Colm Murphy. Colm, welcome to the program. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Give us your title and, uh, and a little bit of background on, uh, on your role at Bell Geospace. Hello, Tyler, and it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Colm Murphy. I'm, I'm Chief Geoscientist with Bell Geospace. My expertise is with the FTG technology, that's full tensor gravity gradiometry, and how it is used in both oil and gas and mineral exploration. Uh, I lead a team that assesses the FTG application for these projects. We set out the survey programs, we perform the data analysis and interpretation when it comes in, and then we use that and use that to inform, make these informed decisions for ranking areas for great exploration potential. I'm a geologist and a geophysicist, I specialize in gravity, magnetics, and the FTG data workflows for effective exploration. I've been in the industry for nearly 30 years, working projects worldwide in a variety of geological settings from rift and salt basins to thrust and fold belt and to volcanic zones in the search for both mineral and oil and gas prospectivity. My team are very driven by geology, much like myself. Uh, we have a clear focus on that area and we developed numerous intuitive methods for interrogating the FTG, the gravity and the magnetics to extract detailed geological information. Uh, the work has led to many successful projects around the world, identifying clear prospectivity from both the basin and province scale right down to the prospect scale. My experience with carbonates, as what we're going to be talking about today, it's, it's varied over the different stages of my career, from my student days when I spent mapping reef limestones in Ireland, and finally leading on towards to analysing geophysical responses from survey data acquired across Southeast Asia, South Africa, US and Ireland. Fantastic stuff. Colm, we are lucky to have you on the show today. Thank you again so much for joining us. Um, also joining us today is Graham Banks. Uh, Graham, give us a little bit of uh, your background as well and give us your title and, uh, and who you're working for. Sure. Thank you very much. So hi, my name is Graham Banks. I'm the founder and the principal chief scientist of an exploration consultancy called Roots Reserves based in Copenhagen in Denmark and also Vancouver. In Canada. Um, I assist exploration companies um, all the way through from forming their exploration strategy all the way to ranking their drilling targets for either petroleum, base metals or critical metals. I'm also a principal geologist associate for Southern Geoscience Consultants which is a team of uh, geoscientists and geophysicists mainly based in Perth, Toronto and Vancouver and um, who provide geophysical services to the mineral and petroleum exploration industries globally. So I'm a principal uh, exploration geoscientist, 15 years industry experience, um, helping companies explore for gold, copper, rare earth elements, cobalt and petroleum. I also did postdoctoral research designing the mineral system framework for critical uh, metals. And um, most of my experience has been, again, early um, exploration stage projects, building petroleum systems, building mineral systems, all the way through to uh, deposits um, of the commodities, and also assessing exploration licenses. I've worked on drilling, uh, sorry, creating uh, prospects to drill ready status. I've worked on the rigs for both oil uh, exploration in Iraq and also for gold exploration in East Africa. Um, I expanded, I guess, from being an originally a structural geologist to now guide multidisciplinary teams through their project, chance of success, uncertainty, risk, um, exploration metrics. Um, and I've worked again on carbonate rocks, Middle East, North Africa, Canada, uh, the UK, Germany, uh, looking for various commodities. And then Southern Geoscience Consultants, they've got decades of global experience also uh, exploring using geophysical parameters for carbonate rocks, again, for petroleum, base metals, precious metals, and also critical metals. Fantastic stuff, Graham. Thank you so much for, for sharing. Obviously a, a world traveler, and so we're excited to get your perspective on a, a lot of different things here on the show today. And, and finally, last but not least, Gene Shea joins us. Gene, it's a pleasure to have you on. Once again, uh, just give us a little bit of your background and, uh, and tell us a little bit more about your title and what you're doing right now. Great, thank you for having me here. Um, I'm a sedimentologist and stratigrapher, so basically I study rocks. I specialize in carbonate rocks. I've worked over 20 years in the oil and gas industry um, for various companies like Chevron, Talisman, Repsol. 
Um, I've worked in exploration and development for carbonates, as well as some unconventionals and recently in some plastic reservoirs. But my specialty and my love is still with carbonates. <laughs> I've worked um, all around the globe too, um, uh, mostly West Texas, Middle East. Um, I overlap with um, Graham in Kurdistan when we worked together not so long ago. Um, some in North and West Africa, Southeast Asia, particularly around in the Black Sea and Caspian Sea areas as well as most recently in the Circum Gulf of Mexico. I, like, I enjoy looking at carbonate rocks and trying to figure out what happened to them. And I interact a lot with all the other specialists, um, geophysicists, uh, geochemists, as well as uh, modelers and petrophysicists as well. Well, fantastic stuff. We have a, uh, a panel here, here of all stars as we talk about carbonates. And they, I figure if we're going to talk about carbonates, let's start off with the very most basic question that we can to get our conversation rolling today. So I'll throw it out there to the group. What exactly are carbonates? So carbonate rocks are uh, rocks that uh, contain over 50% carbonate minerals. So these minerals are calcite, dolomite, and aragonite. Um, the rock names that you might have heard of are limestone. Oh, Graham's holding up a piece there. <laughs> limestone, <laughs> dolostone, marble, or carbonatite. So one of the most common ways we get carbonate is from um, sedimentary carbonate. So these form as a chemical precipitate. And the most common way um, presently is directly from seawater or mediated through an organism. So we get them in areas that are in shallow, warm water. So like Graham's got a coral there. So we know these rocks as reefs. Um, people like to swim, snorkel, some scuba dive around them. And so mostly we have in the present day corals and other critters that have shells that are made of calcite or aragonite. And if you swam near a reef though, you will see that there's a lot of other fish and other creatures that live there and they modify things by biting off pieces, breaking things up. So you get a lot of sediment and the sediment can produce sand that can be moved around and we form what we call shoals or we have a sand apron or we have underwater dunes. And also there's lots of plants like green and red algae that produce carbonate mud. So this is the slimy stuff we see. And that can fill up things like lagoons or tidal flats. And all of these things to put together, we call carbonate rocks in the rock record. There's a couple of other ways to get um, carbonates as well. We can have them precipitate in lakes. So we think of tufas, um, things like Mono Lake in California. Um, and then we can have them in caves. So if we think of the standard um, stalactites and stalagmites, these are made of carbonate rocks. Um, if all of these rocks are subjected to burial or collisions in mountain um, belts or proximities to hot fluids like magmas, you can metamorphose them into what we call marbles or scarns. And then there's another uh, category of weird rocks <laughs> we'll talk about a little bit more, carbonate magmas, which form um, carbonatites when they solidify. So because these are all carbonate minerals and um, formed of carbonate minerals and minerals are pretty soluble in water, we can get them easily dissolved by rainfall and groundwater. And then we have things such as caves, karsts and other voids that can form in carbonate rocks. Yeah, and actually I would like to add here that it's those dissolution cavities in the form of caves or caverns or vogues as they may be called, they're all fracture patterns that makes geophysical survey work such as FTG uh, which makes them suitable for exploration in carbonate environments. The, the cavities themselves still generate uh, significant geophysical responses. And in the case of FTG, it's a density contrast that is detected. And we analyze that signal to learn more about the shape and form and extent, and then map the subsurface distribution across the survey area. Fantastic. Oops, sorry, yeah. say, and of course, these rocks are really important. The holes in these rocks are really important because it's the holes that can contain metals, petroleum, and other resources for us. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And so uh, as we talk about that, now, I feel like what, what Jean just said carries really nicely into this next question. Why is, it, why is this an important topic right now? Why is it so important to talk about carbonate rocks right now? And, and you know, why do a podcast over it? <laughs> So if I can chip in a bit there, so um, the, looking at the big picture, the human population is predicted to increase by three and a half billion people this century. And two thirds of those people are gonna be living in the cities. So we have to try and imagine the volume of new night lighting and electronic hardware, wire, galvanized steel, tarmac, fuel to 
power those machines that are going to build the equivalent of a New York City every year? And what rocks are we going to go and find all of those raw materials in? And so looking to the future, carbonate rocks should be at the forefront of our minds as exploration targets because of their historic track record of yielding vast amounts of essential materials. So carbonate rocks, they provide global society with cement for concrete, which of course we've been using for 2000 years to build our cities. That comes from either limestone or shells or from chalk, carbonate material. Much of the world's petroleum for the last, again, 100 years or so has come from carbonate rocks. We use this petroleum, obviously, to power our vehicles and to make our roads. But of course, we're completely dependent on oil or our plastic, <laughs> our ability to communicate, our cooking gas, our shoes, etc. Rare earth elements are a group of commodities which there's a lot of social uh, media about. And we need rare earth elements for LCD screens, for our mobile phones, and for permanent magnets in wind turbines and electric cars, and also hospital equipment, part of our low carbon transition. And then metals like tungsten, that's the filaments in how many millions of light bulbs over the last century, zinc, which we use to galvanize iron to stop it from rusting, copper for electric wires, and also lead for how many billions of batteries over the last century. Um, most of those, a lot of those commodities come from carbonate rocks. So I try and imagine how would society have evolved or maybe not evolved over the last hundred years without tungsten for light bulbs with much less road asphalt and much more expensive fuel for our vehicles and our construction machines as well. How will society be if our buildings and our cars rusted very quickly, if we didn't have plastic bottles to sanitize our hands in COVID times, and our camping equipment, and our computer screens and our smartphones and everything else without the commodities that have come from carbonate rocks. So I think um, in terms of our future, we need to be thinking about critical metals for a low carbon economy and the petroleum that will be needed to fuel that transition so that we can sustain, I guess, population growth and uh, reduction in poverty. And we need those commodities to come from carbonate rocks. So from, from your perspective, what makes carbonates challenging and exciting to work with? All of you have so much experience working in this particular area. Just from your experiences, you know, what, what makes them challenging and also exciting, just given the, the, their high importance that, that Graham was just describing? I think carbonate rocks are um, exciting to work with because they're not simply moved around by water and wind. So we think about these physical um, chemical processes that pay, play a part in a lot of what we call siliciclastic rocks, the quartz sand that we're used to seeing. But carbonates are exciting in my mind because there's this whole other component, this biological component that plays a large role in how they are formed. So the carbonate sedimentologist needs to be almost a little jack of all trades in science, putting together the physical processes, the chemical processes, and the biological clues to figure out how the rocks are formed. And so now we can take a clue from the modern day um, carbonate rocks. When they form, they're very large in size and aerial extent. So for mineral and petroleum exploration, the prize of finding one of these very large accumulations is, it's, I mean, it's a great prize. Um, they, there are times where we see the average um, carbonate can be three to five times larger than a Celeste Classic Reservoir. So there's a high reward if we can find one of these things. But as I just mentioned with these other processes and especially the biological process, it's a little bit um, harder to predict. There's a wider range of possibilities of how they could turn out and therefore a wider uncertainty in predicting where to find the good reservoir quality, especially in the subsurface environment. Yeah, and it's with this uncertainty that's the, the key challenge for all of us working in carbonates. Basically, it requires the right expertise and the right data to make it work. Carbonates, from a geophysical perspective, they're generally higher in density than other sedimentary rocks, and so generate a significant gravity and FTG anomalous responses. But these responses, they're varied, showing a myriad of different patterns, leading to a sense of uncertainty in itself. Uh, Reefal buildups and massively bedded limestone they yield very positive and profound anomaly patterns and so are easily identifiable. Then you look at karstified areas and, and they too, they also show clear anomalous patterns, but they tend to be rather more chaotic in appearance. But yet you can discern a good map and discern good shape and form information from that. 
to help reduce that uncertainty. So it's the density contrasts that make hybrids particularly suited for detecting with the technologies. That's just one form. And, and there are other challenges, as, as Jean and, and Graeme will happily share with us, I guess. I, I, carbonates have been described as high risk, high reward, and that's kind of something that, that Gene was, was referring to, right, is that there is a high reward there, but there's also a risk on the other side, right? Uh, Gene, is, is, would, would you say that that term, high risk, high reward, is accurate when it comes to describing carbonates? I think it's, it's a way that we like to think of it. I'm not, I, I think the group of us here don't really like to think of it as high risk, but just a, a, a higher uncertainty or greater uncertainty, wider range of possibilities. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and therefore, you need to be able to study the rocks and get a better feeling for what's going on to try to reduce that uncertainty. It's really important to get the right people together in order to do that. Yeah, that takes me right to my next question and, and the, the, the next thing I wanted to ask anyways, which is, uh, which is fantastic, Gene. It's almost like you read my mind. Uh, but uh, I, I was wondering if you could explain the importance um, along the lines of what Gene was saying uh, of partnering with the right people who have the right knowledge when it comes to carbonates. So, uh, explain to me uh, why that's such an important thing. Yeah, sure. So as, as Gene and uh, Colm were alluding to, we're trying to detect and measure the properties of carbonate rocks and also their fracture systems and also uh, the fluids or the metals that are hosted in those fat systems, even though they're buried under the soil, underneath vegetation, forests, and maybe even four to seven kilometers deep. And so that's a bit of a challenge. And so what we need to do is make sure that an exploration team has got the, um, a broad span of skills um, to be able to uh, meet those challenges, and meet those interpretations. So some exploration companies will have all of those skills in house and other companies will have to obviously contract to specialists in service companies. So in an ideal world, a carbonate exploration team will contain a carbonate sedimentologist and stratigrapher like Gene, a structural geologist who understands deformation, the cracks, the faults, the fractures and the rocks. So like myself, we need geophysicists who can acquire geophysical data, process it and then interpret it as well like Belgia Space and Southern Geoscience Consultants do. There should be a petrophysicist in the team. At least one of the geoscientists needs to be able to model exploration of certainty, value and risk of the project and the value of new information. That's something I can help with. And then we need at least one or two integrators who know enough of all of those different aspects of, of carbon exploration to put it all together and create a, uh, an exploration strategy which is going to hopefully create value rather than just cost. And again, that's something that uh, I'm able to do. As well as that, industry and research need to also be collaborating. Um, academics have a lot of uh, depth and experience in particular aspects of carbonate rocks and the commodities they contain. And so in my opinion, it's really important that the mineral exploration sector and the petroleum exploration sector and then the academic research sector are all collaborating and sharing the knowledge a lot more than they currently do. Because ultimately, they're all parts of the same goal, which is to try and find hidden, buried, new um, deposits of commodities, which we need um, to, to enhance and, and grow our society. And so there are several techniques, for example, FTG, which uh, Colm will tell you a bit more about. Seismic data is used a lot in petroleum exploration. The people, the geoscientists need to have a fluid system approach. Where did the hot water go? Deposit the metals in the carbonates. Where would the oil and gas have gone to within the carbonate system or basin? And also people need to have a probability of success mindset. Exploration is a challenge and um, we need to be able to understand the, the uh, uncertainties, and the probability of success as well as failure. And that all needs to be done within the right within a single team. And if there are bits missing, then of course, there's going to be more uncertainty, risk, um, and possibly failure of projects. Yeah, I'd just like to add in just to add some context to, from a geophysical, geological perspective is that integration is fundamental. It's key to unraveling the, the complexities that we, we face in working with carbonates. Um, working them together helps to define our target play model type that, that we want to strive and to work on. Um, 
we see all this, a lot of this through intuitive workflows that combine not only FTG's ability to map density change, but electromagnetic stability to hone in on conductive resistive zones along fault planes or in voids, and then magnetics to map the primary structural controls, and of course the seismic to map the detailed depiction of clear layered models. Uh, the integrated results from geophysics, particularly with the FTG, uh, and with, with, together with sound geological reasoning can lead to very informative play models. Uh, the FTG is quite adept at, at doing this, at, uh, when it images differing linear trends so that when you work them out geologically, it can be very, very revealing. And we see this in, in our current work program in Malaysia, where we're, we're mapping presence of carbon reef structures at around 1,200 meters depth. And these are sitting proximal to a clear and definitive strike step fault trend that actually serves as a conduit for the upward migration from hydrocarbons underneath. So to get integration is, is, is quite good, it's quite key in, in, in making it work for us. Yeah, I think that for carbonate, success is no longer thinking about like a lone geologist going out in the field and figuring it out, but rather yeah. a whole team <laughs> together, put it, um, managing all the little parts that um, integrate fully to understanding a carbonate reservoir. So, Gene, let's talk about petroleum in carbonate reservoirs. Uh, I would love to learn a little bit more about that from, from your perspective, given that, that you have a lot of experience in this area. Great. So, um, yeah, carbonates. So when I one of the first slides I show when I teach introductory carbonates in the petroleum industry is um, telling you how much oil and gas there is in carbonate rocks. So we all remember um, in the 1970s, all the Middle East oil being um, um, causing political issues. So yeah, there's a lot of oil and gas there. Over 35% of the world's oil and gas reserves lie in carbonate rocks these days. Um, and one of the companies I used to work for, that their um, portfolio had over 50% um, in these carbonate rocks. So understanding these rocks is really important. And um, we may not um, think of just, well, it's in the Middle East, maybe it's not for us to worry about and it's just for those guys, those countries to worry about. But through time, we've evolved and we found lots of huge provinces of carbonate rocks. Um, for instance, we have all of the large fields in Russia and all the former Soviet unions around the Caspian Sea. Um, and in recent 10 years, we've uh, discovered huge reserves in what we call the pre-salt reservoirs offshore Brazil and offshore West Africa. So a lot of times, um, carbonate rocks may not come to mind right away, but there are a lot of different places where we can find these kinds of rocks and petroleum in, within them. Yep, I'd like to add on to that if I can, Gene. Obviously, you and I work together um, in Iraqi Kurdistan um, on the petroleum carbonate reservoirs. I'll just give a just a, a bit of background, maybe on, on why they're so important in the Middle East and why they have why the Middle East carbonate rocks have been so important to the last sixty years. So, um, petroleum has had the biggest impact on human development and improvement of quality of life of any other commodity from rocks, maybe apart from water. 11 of the world's 15 biggest oil and gas fields are in carbonate reservoirs, which is a significant percentage of the uh, global daily consumption of petroleum. There are two super giant oil fields that I'll quickly mention. One's called Gwar oil field in Saudi Arabia. Another one's called Kirkuk oil field in Iraq. And Gwar oil field has been the king of oil fields for 65 years. Just a couple of numbers. It's produced 55 billion barrels of oil, which would be like Manhattan skyscrapers, but just made out of oil barrels. Wow, um, wow. This one oil field has given us 5% of the world's global demand. And obviously as consumers, you know, we are demanding oil. That's why it's produced um, for three decades. The Arab D formation is the main carbonate reservoir rock. <clears throat> it's a Jurassic aged carbonate rock. It was deposited in a shallow, marine setting, and it contains about 15% porosity. So if you can imagine, let's find the coral. So you can imagine a rock that's a bit like a sponge and 15% of that volume is holes containing um, oil. And it also has permeability, which means that the holes are connected. And so the petroleum can move through the rock, not just be stored in holes within it. And so the porosity and permeability um, of, the, of the Arab um, D formation is what's you know, given us 5% of our global uh, consumption. Um, if that's not phenomenal enough, underneath it is another layer of rock called the Kuf carbonates, and that's producing gas, up to 6 billion standard cubic feet of gas per day. If you think of Canada, 
how big it is and it being you know, a, a cold country. Um, half of Canada's daily gas consumption is produced just from a single layer of carbonate rock underneath wow. Kowala oil field. Kirkuk field was very famous when it was discovered because it was the biggest oil field in the world in the 1930s, 40s, 50s uh, at 38 billion barrels of oil. And it's the Kirkuk field that indirectly meant that Gene and I worked together um, in the license acreage just next to Kirkuk field to try and find another Kirkuk field for our uh, employers. And it's carbonate reservoir called the Kirkuk Group. Again, it has high porosity and permeability. So lots of holes in the rock that are well connected. Um, some of those um, holes are as big as caves. There was a report that one of the wells when it was being drilled uh, and the drilling bit was penetrating down through the rock and then it fell 14 meters. So in, inside a cave and a cave system full of oil. Um, some of those individual wells have produced 100,000 barrels of oil per day. For perspective, 132 countries in the world don't use 100,000 barrels of oil per day <laughs> on a national scale. And yet individual holes in the ground have yielded that from Kirkuk. Um, it's been producing uh, tens of thousands of barrels a day for over 80 years. So that's just a bit of perspective about why the, it's important to understand prosty, permeability, and the fracture system uh, of carbonate rocks. Yeah, these are gigantic uh, fields and, and, and systems in the subsurface. And you know, when we're looking at to explore for these features, we often need to look at present day analogues to get a, a sense of what it is we're trying to find. So we, we think that you know, we look at it and we say the present is the key to the past. We can study the shapes and sizes of today's carbonate environments and help them to help us envisage what the buried ones would look like and what types of tectonic settings uh, to look for them in. One, we see this clearly when looking at, say, atoll structures across the Pacific, and these are large, round, almost donut-shaped structures defined by a ring of carbonate buildups and then centered by a set of lagoonal sediments. Similar features are seen in the geological record from the past, such as the Tuxpan Plateau, which is buried about one to two kilometers deep beneath the transition zone uh, in, the, in, in the Gulf of Mexico. And then there's another beneath Laconia offshore uh, Malaysia. The structural shapes, they generate a wonderful ring-shaped positive gravity anomaly picked up with gravity and FTG techniques. And it's, it's fantastic that both regions are significant producers of hydrocarbons, adding to the fantastic supply that we already get from the Middle East. So they're good things to look for. So as we're having this conversation, how does petroleum fit into the larger conversations we're having regarding sustainability and the low carbon economy? Yeah, I could uh, I can answer that. So let's start with where society is at the moment. The global economy is a high carbon economy. Carbon plays an important role in energy generation and construction and also transport. So not just transport. Carbon compounds, which are emitted by um, these industries, have caused global scale pollution and human influenced global warming. And thankfully, we're now trying to progress to a low carbon economy and a transition from the carbon era and into the electric era. But the obvious question is, why do we use these high carbon polluting sources in the first place? So I'll just give a couple of uh, bullet points. Cement is a vital ingredient of concrete and that is produced from carbonate rocks and it obviously causes a lot of pollution. Um, but that's how we've chosen to build our cities and our houses since Roman times. Gasoline or petrol for our road vehicles is the fuel. Uh, it, it's an energy rich fuel. It's easy to purchase. It's easy to carry. It's safe and it can be poured. So in some ways it's like a miracle energy um, uh, storage method. And compared to Evian water, for example, it's obviously much cheaper than bottled water that, that we buy at the supermarkets. Petroleum is the fuel that brings our avocados and our strawberries to our supermarkets in January in our Arctic countries. It brings our Amazon purchases, it brings our Christmas presents from the factories we have that made. It's petroleum that keeps our shops full of items that we demand at an acceptable price level. It's much easier for us to get to work or home from the supermarket or to the campsite using a petrol powered vehicle than it is to walk and carry all that stuff. And that's the way we've been for a century. 
So the irony is not really lost on us that petroleum is going to be the fuel of our transition to a low carbon economy. It's going to be petroleum, which is the fuel to build wind turbines and solar panels in factories and transport them across uh, the oceans to where they're going to be located. We already have um, enough global reserves of petroleum. We can't burn all of that if we want to stay within 1.5 Celsius of pre-industrial uh, global temperature. But on the other hand, we still need to make sure that we have a safe, stable, diversified supply of petroleum to fuel this transition to the low carbon economy. And so we still need to go looking for more petroleum in carbonate rocks. We want to make sure that energy companies that ad adhere to our high expectations and corporate governance are enabled to give us the fuel that we demand rather than just um, companies that don't adhere to the expectations and um, governance that we expect. And so the irony is also not lost on us that it's carbon rich rocks, it's carbon eights that will be yielding the petroleum that we need to burn to fuel the green transition. And so you know, transition is a very important word and uh, so are carbon eights and petroleum in the near term. And it's also amusingly enough that um, we can capture carbon from our atmosphere and so on, this transition to the green, by uh, depositing these modern carbonate rocks. So there we go. <laughs> <laughs> and, and yes, and uh, transition is the key word here for us to go move forward uh, in the years to come. And technology has much to add to that. Not only does it we need it to detect, appraise and extract new materials, but we need to do so in a very environmentally conscious way. Airborne geophysics when planned efficiently negates the need for costly ground exploration programs. In other words, there will be less need to clear scrub, drill the umpteen holes that, that often get drilled, uh, the excess cabling, or even have excess people and vehicles roaming about. FTG, gravity and magnetics then when acquired on an airborne survey program, that allows you to quickly to delineate the primary and the key structural targets in the subsurface, uh, all or in a cross a large survey area in a very quick time especially when an aircraft flying at 100 meters above the ground. This helps to reduce the uncertainty, allowing the explorer to directly focus their exploration efforts with the minimal footprint. Or, or to give an example on that, our, our current work program in, in offshore Malaysia with Petronas is a clear example of how we go about doing this uh, efficient exploration work programs. Uh, we're, we're currently acquiring a very large scale multi-client offering of FTG and magnetic data to help improve the imagery of the deeper prospective opportunities that would otherwise be cost prohibitive for the explorers uh, to pursue. The operators then were able to use our data to hone in and focus their efforts more efficiently, thus reducing their footprint on the environment. Yeah. So how are carbonates important for, for metals exploration? Uh, can, can we dive into that topic as well? Sure. I mean, carbonates are the host rock for petroleum reservoirs. They can also be host rocks for the metals as well. We know um, what we know about them is that they have holes and they're good, well connected. And so, a lot of ways that we study them are the same. And it doesn't matter whether we're searching for oil or metals. It's the particular environment where it's in. Um, we need to understand how to look for them so that we can find these resources. Yep, yeah, exactly. And and the building blocks for a low carbon digitized economy are critical metals and base metals. Um, I'll give you a few examples. So tungsten and rare earth elements, they're now on the critical minerals lists of the USA, the EU and Canada. And copper is another metal which is crucial for electrical systems. And that's also on Canada's uh, critical minerals list. Um, so first of all, I'll talk to you a little bit about a type of carbonate rock that Gene mentioned before called SCARN. And SCARN is a type of rock which is formed when very hot waters, hundreds of Celsius, um, relating to volcanic systems, volcanoes, um, replace limestones and dollar stones like this. And they also carry metals in solution and they deposit those metals into the scar. So most of the tungsten that we've used for light bulbs for over a century have come from scarns um, and they're often um, concentrated in North America and also in China. But scarns are also sources of copper and iron gold and zinc. The rare earth elements are a group of metals which, as I said before, we require them for permanent magnets in electric cars and wind turbines. It's like the transmission, the, the drivetrain between the wheels 
and uh, the electricity uh, generator. We also need rare earth elements for mobile phones and for our LCD screens and our laptops. And they get a lot of attention because China provides 60% of the world's rare earth elements and it also holds about 30% of global reserves. And so um, a lot of stakeholders, countries, governments want to see my more diversified supply of rare earth elements from several different countries. So what we need to do is to go and find um, those in carbonatite rocks. They're, they're quite an unusual and fascinating rock type. Um, it's a magma from 100 kilometers deep in the Earth's mantle, except its composition is basically like salty chalk lava. And sometimes it comes to surface and dribbles out of these carbonatite volcanoes. There's one uh, in Tanzania, uh, which is right recent. Otherwise, these sort of brine chalk magmas, they get trapped in the plumbing systems underneath volcanoes and the rare earth elements get trapped there with them. Um, and what we want to do, therefore, is to try and find more of these carbonatite rock types with rare earth elements, hopefully in them as well. And so geophysics is going to be a vital way, a technique, to try and find carbonatites that host these rare earth elements using either aeroplanes, helicopters or drones. What we want to do is to try and measure anomalies in the Earth's gravity or uh, magnetic field, electromagnetic behaviour, and also its radioactive behaviour, because um, this is how we're going to find these carbonatite uh, rock units. And it's quite interesting because in the 1950s, there was a lot of search for uranium around the world, and airborne geophysics surveys um, used radiometric tools, and because uranium and thorium behave the same way as rare earth elements, in magmas, in hot fluids underground, that's how a lot of rare earth element deposits in Canada were discovered during the uranium exploration program. And I'll touch on a little bit on zinc and lead as well. These are very important industrial metals. And we also um, get a lot of them from carbonate rocks, from um, carbonate sedimentary platforms that form in the fallen basins of mountain belts. And there's a type of mineral deposit called Mississippi Valley type. Um, and again, the metals are hosted in the fractures and in the cracks um, of the carbonate rocks, like, like you can see here. And um, I think these, these mineral deposits probably deserve a whole podcast for themselves. But what I'll do is I'll just touch on the fact um, that petroleum, lead and zinc um, often move around together in the subsurface which is really uh, useful because it means that people looking for zinc and lead can use petroleum methods, petroleum exploration data sets, and petroleum exploration logic to help uh, find more lead and zinc. Um, it's been known, certainly in the North Sea, for example, that lead and zinc has been discovered by the oil um, exploration uh, drilling campaigns. So to summarize, I guess, it's very important that the metals explorers and the petroleum explorers talk and communicate and share knowledge and techniques a lot more than they currently do at the moment. And all three of our companies are obviously trying to you know, assist and facilitate those discussions across the commodities. Yeah, I'd like to take up a bit more on that. Uh, it's it's clear, fundamental, the, the commonality between, say, petroleum explorers and mineral explorers is indeed a need to map fault patterns and fracture patterns and identify these voids and the like. They're all critical for efficient exploration uh, at least just good fundamental exploration and, and we can understand the complexity a bit more. FTG, of course, and ourselves at Bell, we've seen a lot of the value of this in our projects, be it for minerals or oil and gas. And in minerals, we've done projects uh, mapping structures in the karstified bedrock for alluvial diamond exploration in South Africa, with uh, base metal exploration in the Irish Midlands, gold in West Africa, and onwards into unconventionals in Ohio and offshore Malaysia all with the principle of mapping fault patterns. The, the karstified bedrock, it not only serves to create a unique and buried crevices and vogues and the like, but in their own right, they've helped to define a subsurface topography that is partially shaped by paleo channels. The ancient channels themselves, they will carry the road of material from afar, be it gold or diamonds, that often get trapped at different bends or holes in the subsurface. We, we did a survey outside Johannesburg with that kind of geological model in our minds. The initial results were quite instrumental in that they allowed the client to redefine their play maps, 
uh, before contracting us to fly a much larger survey over a larger, more extensive area. Scarns, as Graham has described earlier, they're fantastic zones for mineral prospectivity. Uh, these are noted in different parts of the world and in West Africa serve as a plane model for gold mineralization. The brine mixing with the hydrothermal fluid served to dissolve carbonate that filled with a metal on the floor and then subsequently filled by lower density material above that. It's with combined usage of gravity to pick up on the density lows uh, with, with corresponding electromagnetics picking up the conductive sulfide deposits. These allowed explorers to hone their efforts by mapping the combined anomalous response to make their exploration work. Carbonatites then are another form, as Gene has described, and as Graham has described quite well, that these are directly suited for detection with the FTG. In fact, they also give us not only the positive FTG gravity anomaly, but also positive magnetics. And so we can use them quite neatly to map their distribution uh, across the board. Absolutely. Well, everyone, we are pressed for time. And so I'm going to skip ahead a little bit in our conversation because I really want to hear uh, just quickly from each of you. What are some of the uh, maybe what's the most valuable lesson you've learned throughout your career? We've talked a lot about uh, examples uh, from your career and times where you've worked together and some of the fantastic places that you have all been and, and, and collaborated on, on different projects. I'd love to hear just the most valuable lesson you've learned uh, when it comes to working with carbonates um, from your career. Sure. Um one of the things when I teach my introductory class, as I was talking about, the most common remark I hear from all the students is, oh my goodness, these things change completely <laughs> after they deposit, but how in the world do we predict anything? And so, yeah, it's it's a lot, um, a giggle, but there's lots of transformations of carbonate rocks during and after deposition. And each of these steps is possible to predict, I think. We need to um, get, get to know the rocks. We need to look at each of the pieces of data that come in. You can't just generalize. Uh, it's kind of like talking about people. You can't generalize about one group of people or carbonate rocks. We need to go in, we need to look at each piece of information. We need to look at the biology. We need to look at the critters. We need to look at uh, what physical processes happened, what chemical things happened afterwards. And then at that point in time, um, then we put all the pieces together, we can then predict what's happening. It's, I think that each discovery, each reservoir that we work on, each place is like trying to meet a different person. You've got to find out that individual carbonate's history and then tell the story of how it came to be. And so I've learned that through my life that you, there's no generalization. You got to get to know this rock. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think just to add to that, um... The most, probably the most valuable experience I've learned to summarize it is just the importance of sharing knowledge and the insurance of so the, the importance of um, asking people for their knowledge either of carbonate or petroleum or groundwater or metal systems. I'll give you a couple of examples here. I have a bit of time. So Jean and I both worked in Iraqi Kurdistan. Um, our two companies were in a joint venture partnership. And of course, the value of that shared information and, um, and collective knowledge was very important. So we didn't just have one company with one particular idea. Very important to have the alternative um, hypotheses. And then I went to Iraqi Kurdistan, as Jean also did, um, mm -hmm. to go and do field work. And the purpose of that was to go and look at these carbonate rocks at surface to get um, an analog, an understanding of how they could behave at three, four kilometers depth in terms of how um, they could be permeable for either oil or gas or water um, or metal deposition. So when I was doing field work, I had a security team of four people. Um, obviously, this is Iraq, and we needed a bit of security um, at that time. And I was saying to my, my, my soldiers, if you like, um, that we need to try and find carbonate rocks where they've got lots of cracks in them and where oil can maybe move through those cracks so we can give my reservoir engineer a bit of a, of a concept for the model. And so, of course, they knew where to go they knew that there was a place where there was a bitumen fall, so not a waterfall, but an oil fall, where oil was just pouring out of a limestone cliff. And they took us there, and there it was, not just a waterfall, but there was just bitumen streaming down the side of the cliff at Bekme Gorge. And of course, the local people knew that, whereas the foreign geoscientists would never have had that knowledge. It was very important to share those ideas. Um, so I was able to write back to the reservoir engineer in Calgary and just say, these rocks, they, are, they have cracks in them, and I've got photographs of the oil bleeding out of them. And the local people use that to waterproof their, their roofs, 
and also to um, heal wounds which their sheep had on their skin, which is very interesting. So I then mentioned to them that we had to try and find examples of where the cracks in the caves are very big, so we can get an idea of how much fluid, either water or oil or gas, can flow through these carbonate rocks. And so, of course, again, the soldiers knew exactly what, where to go, and the foreign geologists wouldn't have done so. And they took me to a place called Rwanda's Gorge, which is a bit like a mini Grand Canyon, where the cliffs are about a kilometre tall, and it's a tens of kilometres long uh, canyon of limestone and dollar stone, and that's been eroded out by the river over millions of years. And those mountains on either side were completely pervaded by a fracture system, uh, lots of cracks, caves, um, vogs, etc. And the whole mountain would therefore fill like a sponge with rainwater and, and, and snow um, and that melted. And they took me to a waterfall. This waterfall was a cave around 10 meters wide on the side of a limestone cliff that was just jetting water out from inside that sponge carbonate mountain. Um, maybe the volume of a house full of water every second. And so I was able to send another photograph, another message to the reservoir engineer back in Calgary to say, if we find carbonate rocks with this sort of fracture system, this sort of permeability, we will probably get some serious oil flow. And Sarkala oil fields now producing at 30,000 barrels a day certainly is in rocks with cracks like that, with permeability like that. So it's very important to gain an analog, to go and look at an example of where this could work, and to listen to the local people, and of course, have the knowledge. Uh, not, not just to have your own sheer science knowledge, I guess. Another example, if I have time, is that because I was a geologist driving around the Iraqi desert, um, I was the face of the company in these, in, in these regions that um, were quite isolated. And so if there was an issue in a village, then I would be the foreigner that they would speak to. And there was a village that translates, its name was translated to Harry, as in Harry. <laughs> and the chief of the village, the tribal elder, he had a bit of an issue with his waterworks. And he was a bit embarrassed for anybody else in the village to know about it. So, of course, the foreign petroleum geologist turned up um, and we had to obviously try and help instead. And what had happened is there'd been an earthquake and the natural carbonate rocks, which are the groundwater aquifer, had been the, the fracture system had been rejigged, and now oil was leaking up into the natural groundwater system, naturally, and was leaking up into his water well and his water tank, which of course is a health hazard. They were drinking petroleum laden water mm -hmm. coming out of the ground. So I was then able to communicate that back to my company, who could then send an engineer to then start building relationships with the local community, which is very important if you're going to explore either for metals or for petroleum or water. So um, that's two examples. And then if I have a minute to tell you another one, um, I used to show, um, as a structural geologist, how the cracks and the faults and fractures may... Sure, sorry about that. Yeah, yeah. Colm, uh, quickly give us uh, your, your biggest lesson here that you've gotten for us. My biggest lesson is sharing of knowledge is the most fundamental route to success and uh, and people don't often get together when they should uh, cross discipline is important and we discovered that but looking at anomaly maps and trying to figure out which way is the is the fault uh, orientated where are the other faults and then you engage with a geologist and they bring in their stress and strain analysis techniques and we're able to figure it all out together so that's the fundamental lesson that i have very forward. good stuff. Yeah. Very good stuff. Well, thank you to the three of you for joining us so much here uh, for this episode of A Propensity to Talk Density. Colm, Graham, and Gene, thank you again so much for joining us here for this episode of the show. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your time. It's great Absolutely. to be here. Absolutely. And everyone, thank you for tuning into this episode of the program. Stay tuned for more from Bell Geospace. But for this episode today, I've been your host, Tyler Kern. For our expert panelists today, we'll talk to you again soon.